All right, let's talk about bottling again, except we're going to talk about what we're going to need to be doing in the cellar in terms of winery operations, not necessarily wine chemistry, but really winery ops, uh, things that we're looking for to be able to do to get the job done. So three months out uh, with red and white wine, you've got to do any final blending uh, three months out, you know, because whenever you're going to put two different wines together, even if each wine in and of itself is stable, when you put two wines together, they can become unstable. So this is going to allow any instabilities to become apparent, you know, uh, protein, tartrate, phenolic, anything like that. We want to do that as early as we can in the process. Uh, blending uh, late in the game is uh, really, really risky, um, especially with red wines. You can have some tremendous uh, phenolic interactions and things like that. Uh, generally, I recommend reds are blended a little bit before that. Um, many wineries like to do their blends, you know, six months uh, after they produce them and then age them out uh, blended. So <clears throat> there isn't really a right answer there, but that does help to minimize any instabilities. Um, and then three months out, we really need to make sure that we've got our SO2 really in a good spot. You should have your SO2 in a good spot all the time. Uh, you should adjust your acid if necessary. Um, if you need to do, do any acid additions or uh, uh, you want to do that earlier even than that, but uh, if you're going to remove acid with uh, potassium bitartrate or something like that, you need to have at least uh, you know two or so months, at least a month, to be able to get that wine to cold stabilize and settle out. Um, also, if you have some accessional uh, VA, you want to do that, and then ethanol as well. You want to do that a couple months out because you just want the wine to settle down and have any uh, instabilities become apparent. Uh, two months out, uh, final finding if you're going to do any of that, um, and final racking if you're going to do any of that, uh, cold stability. Uh, I do recommend on red wines doing some sort of chilling. It's just kind of nice to turn off the, the temperature in the cellar over the winter, and we can do that here in Washington, uh, and that's really helpful. Um, and then a couple months out, maybe a coarse filtration if you're going to be filtering uh, through plate and frame. You want to get that course filtration done as early as possible just to give you enough time to be able to get it through the next uh, steps. And again, your SO2 adjustment is really important. And the question really with this, how much and what's the right number? So um, we'll get into ageability and things like that because if you're going to sterile filter a wine, well, it doesn't really matter what you're going to do with the red wine. Even if you don't sterile filter, within about five years, there's no SO2 left. So, you know, we add SO2 as an antimicrobial. Well, I can assure you, that within five years, there's no SO2 in the wine anymore. So if you're counting on SO2 to be an antimicrobial, you're in trouble. You know, that wine has to be completely converted. So it has to be completely mallow dry, has to be completely sugar dry if you're gonna be unfiltered. And then your SO2 adjustment is gonna be based on how long you want that wine to live. So one thing you could think of is basically, you know, it's, it's not always the same, but say SO2 drops at say five parts per million a year. Um, then if you bottled with 30 parts free, uh, you'd have six years before you ran out of SO2. And then once that SO2 is gone, you're going to have to have something else there to accept oxygen to help that wine uh, continue to age. And in red wines, that's going to primarily come from, from tannin. There could be some viable uh, microbes, um, other things like that to help that uh, wine age out. Uh, I should say tannin, I should just say phenolics, but... Um, there's going to have to be some other things there that are going to allow that wine to have some potential uh, to stay uh, from oxidizing. So your SO2 adjustment is kind of a tool to how long do you want your wine to age, uh, especially in these high in this high pH wine world that we live in in modern times. Um, you know, very rarely do we bottle wines under pH 3.6 uh, here in Washington. So in terms of reds, so a lot of times our SO2 addition is really not about being an anti, anti uh, <clears throat> microbial at all. It's just that antioxidant piece. And the nice part about higher pH wines, which is kind of crazy, is that especially if you sterile filter them and you don't have to worry about that, you can dial in as much SO2 as you want to make that wine uh, live a long life. There are going to be, of course, some color impacts. The more SO2 you have, the, the more it dings color, but uh, you can actually adjust the longevity by running more SO2. As a blanket rule, we generally bottle with around 30 milligrams a liter of free SO2 in all of our reds. That's a pretty standard number. Um, we, we do tend to sterile filter, so we are just looking for that antimicrobial piece, or not, uh, just an antioxidant piece uh, that SO2 brings to the table just to give our wines plenty of longevity. 
Uh, one month prior in white wine, got to make sure all your protein stability testing is done. Any bentonites additions are done. You got to make sure your tartrate stability is done. You got to make sure it's racked. You've got to make sure it's coarse, uh, coarse filtered. Or in this case, if we're just going to cross flow, we'll just cross flow it about uh, a week before. We won't do any coarse filtration at all. But if you are using a plate and frame, it takes a while. Um, any sorbic acid adjustments on sweet wines. I recommend this adding uh, potassium sorbate uh, to wines. There's some good resources out there on how much you add based on your alcohol content. Uh, but if you're going to make sweet wines um, and you're going to be hand bottling, uh, potassium sorbate is a fantastic tool uh, to help keep those wines from re-fermenting. And then uh, SO2 adjustment with whites. Uh, we can go a little bit higher with whites on the molecular if it's sweet because we're going to be able to uh, have some of that SO2 bind to some of the sugar in the wine. So we want to go a little bit higher with SO2 in sweet wines. Um, not unusual at all to see 1.0, 1.5, you know, things like that in German Rieslings because the pHs are so low. They're still going to bottle with 30 parts free. And that's part of the ageability of German Riesling is that sugar uh, high SO2 combo uh, that lets those, those wines age for a long time. All right, one week before you bottle, this is when you sterile filter. So cross flow, if you're not going to coarse filter it, all you're going to do is cross flow. Um, you want to do that one week out. You want to do it, don't do it any sooner than that. You don't want to do it two weeks before or three weeks before because after you sterile filter, things start growing again pretty quickly. And even though you've sterile filtered it, there's a very, very reasonable and real chance that uh, you'll clog up your membranes. So really only about a week beforehand would be the outside edge. Generally, I like to filter uh, three, four, five days before we bottle at most. Um, then this is when we check our SO2 again, adjust if needed. You notice that's on a lot of these slides. Maintaining those SO2s are really important. If you are sterile filtered, again, uh, just kind of going for that 30 parts is a pretty good, pretty good way to way to go because um, that gives you some some timing. I think you want to do is check your DO, your dissolved oxygen is very very important um, because if your dissolved oxygen is over one milligram a liter, you have to sparge with nitrogen and uh, you just do that with a little stone, uh, like you have uh, for doing your micro, your, your meso oxes and, and macro oxes on your red wines that you did. And we just put that in the bottom tank and bubble it. And, and really remarkable, in just a few minutes, you can uh, you know degas a wine pretty quickly. Um, the other thing you do is you could add SO2 to match. Just realize that every one part of uh, DO takes out four parts of SO2, and you can saturate a wine pretty quickly with four or five milligrams a liter of uh, dissolved oxygen. And at that point in time, even if you were going to bottle with 30 parts and you took out 16 to 20 uh, because of bad bottling, uh, your wine's gonna have a pretty short shelf life. So checking that dissolved oxygen is really important. We'll get into that a little bit more uh, with the uh, adaptations and how we, we wanna work on that. Another thing that's really required is a bottling form. Uh, when you're going to go to bottle, make sure you've got your bottling form. Here's a copy of ours, uh, and every winery should have one of these. And it's going to outline what you're bottling, what's your vintage, your lot code, your date you're bottling it, and of course your TTBID number. That needs to be on there. Uh, additionally, your uh, bonded wine number and address need to be on that form. That's a requirement. Um, other things that you can put on there, uh, just good QC things. Did you sterile filter it? If yes, if not, why? Uh, make sure you've got your bottles on there so that they're all being done properly. Um, and then you also want to do an estimate beforehand. Here's how much wine we think we're going to bottle, and then how much did you actually bottle. Uh, that is required uh, by law to have on the form. Then also on bottling checks, the one thing that is required uh, is volume. Uh, the free sulfur and dissolved oxygen are not required, um, but they're a good part of uh, QC, uh, general QC. And so the reason we want to do that is we want to do at least three checks on a, a, one of our runs, which are pretty small. But you'd want to set that number at some amount. Maybe it's 50 cases in a big winery. You pull a bottle and you go measure the, the volume because the TTB requires that we're, we're, we're bottling a proper exact volume. And I know a number of people that have gotten in trouble for bottling. Uh, they got the wrong bottle. So they set the bottle height and it looked good. So they bottled it. But they were actually bottling like 740 mils of wine and they shorted people and uh, have been in trouble and had to do product recalls over it. Uh, so got to, that's a requirement that you're measuring your volume. Free sulfur, pH, and DO. And the primary reason for that is just making sure we're not getting drift. And the dissolved oxygen is really important to make sure we don't have a hole somewhere in the, in the line that we're picking up air. Um, but <clears throat> this is where we're at. And we also want to sign off on it and make sure that we've done that uh, on, a, on a date specifically. 
So dissolved oxygen, why it's so important is it's a major for red wine production. Um, it can be picked up in a lot of different ways. We did some experiments when I was in Adelaide where we did some bottling, where we just like left the tank open. We just bottled water. It was just tank open. And then uh, using the bottling line like we have without purging the, the top or not purging bottles, we were able to get like four and a half milligrams a liter of uh, dissolved oxygen in the bottle, bottling process, which is just terribly destructive. Um, so uh, we can pick it up in a lot of different ways. Uh, but uh, the important part is, is we want to make sure we have as little as possible going into bottle because then we have to use less sulfur. Um, and I think that's a goal of everybody is to use as little SO2 as possible. So a good, well-handled wine, if we don't splash it, do a bunch of silly things to it, we'll have less than one milligram a liter of dissolved oxygen in bottling. And if we do pick up more during the racking or filtering process, um, it's really nice to be able to just sparge that out with nitrogen. Uh, just so you know, um, comparing, because we've been talking about filtration a little bit, um, our cross flows, we tend to pick up none, like zero dissolved oxygen pickup. We gas the tanks on either side. And since we've got the, the cross flow itself, we purge it every time with nitrogen. Um, we see zero dissol dissolved oxygen pickups. But what we do see uh, in plate and frame filtrations, I can see one to two milligrams a liter get picked up in plate and frame. Uh, so that's another good reason to consider uh, just sticking with cross flow. So again, this is why it can happen. So these are some places you can pick it up. Overall, there's just a whole bunch of places where you can pick up a little bit of dissolved oxygen at each stage. And then of course, there's the ullage in the bottle. And this is a particular conundrum for uh, screw caps because you have a really big vacuity or space between the top of the screw cap and the line. Um, I don't know why they don't just make the bottle smaller, but that's the way it is. So um, in, in wines you're going to go to bottle under screw cap uh sometimes it's not a bad idea to add a couple more parts to make up for that little tiny bit of uh, extra ullage that comes in a screw cap line but the upside to that is you never have to worry about the screw cap breathing if you use uh, a tin serenex liner we'll get into different liners uh and why they matter in terms of bottling uh when we, we talk about different closures So this is why it matters. You heard me talk about that. It takes four milligrams a liter of SO2 to neutralize one milligram a liter of uh, O2. So you have to be really uh, good about that. And you can simply measure with a dissolved oxygen meter. They're pretty inexpensive. Really good ones are expensive, like Norbosphere. Some of these other ones are, are 1500 bucks. There's some new ones that are uh, out with, uh, do it with light that are apparently pretty cool. I'm going to look into those. I'll let you know uh, more on that as we, we, we get into that. So here's how you'd adapt for DO. It's just a little equation. So if you just didn't have the ability to work around it, it just lets you know how much more SO2 you need to add. Um, so if we just wanted to make sure that we ended at 30 parts after we bottled or whatever, well, we would, and we had one milligram a liter of DO, we'd want to add an extra four parts. <clears throat> this is that talk about ullage. So the thing is, is that when you measure the actual volume of a bottle, it's pretty surprising how much 750 mils actually is. Do not assume that full is the right volume. Uh, we see some wines that are like mid shoulder and that's 750 mils. And you don't want to battle 760 because that's not on your label and that's not within the, the standards of what the TTB allows. So, uh, and the last thing you also want to do is you don't want to give away free wine. Um, you know, if you takes you 770 mils or 775 mils per bottle, you're giving away a, a, a bottle of wine every you know, X number of bottles. Um, so that's something to really keep in mind. Um, so uh, also remember screw cap ullage can contain basically one milligram per liter of uh, dissolved oxygen. So the way we fix that is if you remember when we bottled our whites, uh, we had a nitrogen dropper that was dripping one little drop of uh, liquid nitrogen in there. So the other thing I want to talk about is dissolved CO2. You can either add it, like our sparkling muscat or sparkling rosé. They can add mouthfeel, which could be good or bad. You know, I don't think I want an oaky, buttery Chardonnay that's fizzy. Uh, but a Riesling, maybe a little bit of DO is okay. A little bit of our scholarship white blend where there's a little off dry and a little bit of spritz can be good. Um, can be perceived as carbonic acid on the palate, which means it can give a wine more acidity than it appear it. So why would you measure it? And the way you measure it is actually with a, a thing called a carbidoser, which is hilarious. And I'll maybe 
make a video of me using one and you can laugh hysterically for hours. Whoever invented it uh, has a wicked sense of humor. Maybe you can look up Carbidoser on YouTube. Maybe I'll find a, a video of it and post it. Um, but uh, it's hilarious. So the reason we measure it is that if we get too much, uh, it can push corks, uh, it can push screw caps, and can cause uh, uh, you know your wine to leak. So you don't want to have more than your closure can handle. So pre-bottling to do, things that you need to do beforehand, just verify, I wrote ETS, but our numbers, chemistry numbers, make any final SO2 ads, spires with a nitrogen stone, have your bottling forms, fill in your Stelvin lot number or cork, have your bottle shape, color, alcohol content, and all your filtration information ready to go. These are the winery ops that have very little to do with wine chemistry. Uh, and, you know, they just generally need to be done before you bottle.